This is a continuation of our lecture on descriptive statistics. Welcome to the lecture. Throughout this course, you'll find references to um, analyzing data with spreadsheets. Uh, the specific tool we're currently using is Microsoft Excel. Um, why do we care? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, this is what people do in the real world. Uh, you don't take a bunch of numbers and analyzing them using pencil and paper and calculators. And you need to know how to how to work, how to work with your data. Uh, even more importantly, if you are an undergraduate student, and that's who this course is aimed at, uh, you need um, such a skill on your resume. Uh, you need to be able to tell a potential employer uh, that you are capable of doing work in spreadsheets with Microsoft Excel. It's currently the standard. Um, there are quite a number of, of our students, from both of us, uh, who got jobs, who got internships in whatever field, didn't even matter, mainly because they had this skill on their resume. So it's, it's important for you to know it for your own career development and also for the content of this course, for the, the subject material of the course. Uh, it happens that on our handouts page on the course website, we have very, very simple step-by-step -step instructions to help you get started using Excel and to help you uh, with the different uh, types of analyses. How do I do regression? How do I do descriptives? How do I get a, uh, a scatter plot? Um, we have those instructions in print form. We have many of them in video tutorials. And, and you, I know you know, I don't have to tell you, you can go on YouTube and find all kinds of uh, tutorials uh, to help you use uh, various intro and advanced features of this software tool. Okay, let's learn how to use Excel, a very powerful tool uh, for statistics. Okay, we have uh, 17 student scores on a national calculus exam. Notice a couple got a zero, and the highest grade looks like a 95. Okay, we have to open up MS Excel. Okay, you go to data analysis, look for analysis tools, and then you look for descriptive statistics. Now, if you can not see the data analysis there, that means you have to use the add-in feature. And you can look it up, or no, we have expl explanations all over the place, how to put in the add-in uh, feature so that you can do descriptive statistics. Okay, once you're in descriptive statistics, make sure to check the summary statistics box. You need to check that box. Okay, enter your data, and now, um, you know, uh, you run it and you'll get the output on the next slide. You'll see what it looks like. Okay, now we see the uh, output using MS Excel. Notice you get the mean. By the way, you get the mean the hard way because it gives you the sum, the sum of the data set, 662. And you should always look at the count to make sure that you get all 17. You know, in this case, N was 17. I've seen students, they type in 20 numbers and the count is 6. You know, they don't notice. you got to look. All right, so if you do 662 over 17, you'll get that mean of 38.94, etc. The standard error we're going to do a little later in the course, so you don't have to worry about it at this point, but it's called the standard error of the mean. Okay, it's used in inference. The median, there it is, 30. The mode is zero. Okay, and then we have the standard deviation. Now, that's the sample standard deviation. There's no room to write the whole thing out. But bear in mind, this is the sample standard deviation. So they divide it by n minus 1. So your standard deviation is 33.44. The variance, just square that. You can get the sample variance. Here it says sample variance. And it's 1,118.43. Kurtosis is never used by us in this course. So ignore it. It's a measure of peakedness, skewness. We know what that is. If it's a very number very close to zero, then you have symmetric data. Here, there seems to be a bit of a positive skew, and that's what happens when the mean and the median are not the same. There's a positive skew. Now we look at the range. The range is just the highest value minus the lowest value, and it gives you the minimum and the maximum. You should always look at that to see if that was the actual minimum and maximum. 
Okay, well, the highest value was 95, the lows was 0, and the range, of course, is 95 minus 0, or 95. And that's basically how you look at the output. It gives you everything in one shot. It's quick, and um, you should uh, learn how to use this tool. It's very powerful. What else can we do with a data set uh, to make it interesting and to learn something about it? Um, we can take our numerical data uh, that has a particular sample mean and a particular standard deviation and transform it into a new set of data that's called standardized data. And we denote it as Z, the original data we might call X. And uh, the uh, new set of data has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. When you standardize data, you know for sure what the mean and standard deviation are. With your original data, they could be anything. Uh, in addition, this transformed data set uh, will not have units. If your original data was in dollars or if your original data was in hours, uh, the standardized data, are, they're pure numbers, uh, no units. Take a look at the formula and you'll see why. Uh, we take our x's, those are on the right, and we transform them into z's. Um, the numerator x minus x bar, and the denominator is s, the standard deviation. So for every value of x, we transform it into a z by taking the deviation around the mean, x minus x bar, and dividing it by s, the standard deviation. That ensures that your standardized data will have a, a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. The, um, you can see how this, the units cancel, because the x and the x bar and the s, they're all in the same units, dollars, 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 hours, 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 and so the units cancel. What can we do with this? We'll see pretty soon when we look at an example. Um, but since the, the a, a transformed data has a mean of zero, uh, any original score that's below the mean will now be negative. It'll be below zero. Anybody who scored, if it's a, if it's a let's say, just as an example, exam scores. If uh, you uh, took an exam and your exam was exactly at the mean, your transformed data, the standardized data, will show a, a score of zero. Any score that's above the mean will end up being positive in the standardized data. Let's look at some examples of uh, standardizing data, turning uh, the data into z-scores. Look at the first one, example one. Uh, very simple data, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Um, six data values, we have a mean of uh, 5, a standard deviation of 3.74. So for each x value, we can convert it into a z with the simple transformation of x minus x bar divided by s. And uh, you get the, the transformed data, the z scores. If you were to add those up and divide by uh, 6, you, you know what you will get, right? you'll get a zero because the mean of the standardized data is zero and the standard deviation, if you figured that out, would be a one. Um, now let's take a look at example two. Example two is exam scores, uh, which are usually standardized. When you get a report, if you take a standardized exam, uh, like the SAT or the GRE, and you get a report, uh, you'll get your your standardized score. You might you'll you'll get your original score and you'll get your standardized score, and it's it's nice to know uh, what everything means, right? Um, so look at the original data. That's all the way to the left. This is, you can imagine this on a timeline from left to right. The first two columns are the original data, first x, and then uh, z, which was the transformation of the original data. X had a mean of 75.57. S uh, standard deviation of uh, the data set was 23.75. And you have all those Z values. Uh, that arrow is highlighting uh, the most unusual Z value, which was negative 
and I'm sorry, negative 2.89, very, very far below the mean. Is that an outlier? Is it a real value? Is it something important that maybe uh, educators should make note of? It, it's also very likely and very possible that maybe it was a data entry error. There's that seven. Let's take a look and find the seven that caused this problem. Um, maybe it was really a 97. So moving along the timeline from left to right, we see that that seven was changed to a 97, which changed everything. Uh, the mean of this uh, data set, these X's, is 79.86. The standard deviation is 18.24. And you see the Z values. Uh, now, which is the most extreme Z value? Negative uh, 3.12, which corresponds to a value of 23. So once we get rid of the 7, the 23 was the next lowest uh, data value. How do we pick it up? Because we, we found the unusual Z value. That's what standardization does for you. And then, you know, we took a look and, and did this again in a, at a third iteration. But um, I think by now you will probably get the idea. Let's uh, continue with our discussion of standardizing data, or some kind of, we can call it z-scores. All right. Generally, you're looking for an unusual z-score because that very often indicates something to look out for. Why? It could be like, as was mentioned, a you know data entry error. If you see a z-score of plus five or more than that, or less than minus five, that's incredibly unusual. Okay. So generally, when data is standardized. About 95.5% of the data should be z-scores between plus 2 and minus 2. Most of the data should be within two standard deviations about the mean, again, if the data is normally distributed. So here are some values, and you'll see this from the z-table, <laughs> directly tied to the z-scores. 95% uh, of the data will be between the values of plus 1.96 and minus 1.96. 99.7% of the data will fall between plus 3 and minus 3. 99.99% of the data will fall between plus 4 and minus 4. So that's actually one way of knowing whether your data follows a normal distribution. You turn them into z-scores and you see how many of them are, let's say, between plus 1.96 and minus 1.96. Now, let's say data is not normally distributed. In fact, it's badly skewed. Remember, normal distribution means symmetric. Let's say it's badly skewed, it's not normal. We still know something called Chebyshev's theorem that 75% of your data should be between plus 2 and minus 2 standard deviations about the mean. So standard deviations give you an indication where your data should be roughly. So worst case scenario, your data should uh, be 75% of your data should be within two standard deviations. If the data is a normally distributed data set, then 95%, 95.5% will be between plus two and minus two. And we'll learn more about normally distributed data throughout the course, okay? How do we uh, summarize data that comes to us in pairs, two variables? Well, it depends on the variables. Remember um, from our very first uh, lecture, uh, you do different things with data that's uh, nominal different, and different things with data that's quantitative. Um, and so nominal and categorical are, are the same. Uh, what do we do with categorical data? Well, we can draw pretty pictures. We can do some kind of graphical stuff, um, which we're not going to look at in this course. Um, and we can use contingency tables, which we will look at and which are important. Uh, we're going to be carrying, um, in, carrying contingency tables forward into another topic, as you'll see. But for now, we can use contingency tables for two uh, variables that are both nominal or categorical. We can get frequencies, we can get percentages, but that's about it. I guess we could look at it and get the modes, of course. Um, but in terms of the two variables working together, uh, two-way frequencies and two-way percentages. What can we do with numerical data? Basically, if we have two variables coming to us in pairs and they're numerical, 
we're looking for some kind of relationship. We're looking to see how they relate to each other. You can do that better with quantitative data than you can with um, categorical data. We can draw a plot of the data where every point on the plot represents a pair of data, call one X, call one Y. Um, we can uh, do correlation, which we will do later in the semester. Uh, look at the relationship between the two variables. We can draw a line uh, regression and analyze that line. And we can, again, we again, we'll learn that uh, uh, more in depth later in this course. Let's look at a contingency table. We're looking at two categorical variables, remember that's nominal data, okay? And we display it in a contingency table. Okay, suppose there's some kind of election coming up and we ask people to identify as for, by party and assuming there are very few in the any other categories we just had to deal with republicans and democrats same with gender as you know there's more than male female but suppose there's just so few so we couldn't analyze it so we have the columns were male female the republican candidate and then we have democrat candidate and notice the total sample size is a thousand so let's see what happened there are 400 men who plan on voting in our sample 250 said they're going for the Republican, 150 said the Democrat. Among the 600 females in the sample, 250 said they're going for the Republican, and 350 said they're going for the Democrat. Now, if you want to turn this into a percentage table, table on the right, which is actually helpful, divide all the numbers by 1,000. That's N, the sample size. There are 1,000 people, divide everything by 1,000. 250 over 1,000, you get 25%. 150 over 1,000, 15%. The total, you can see that 40% of the sample is male, 60% were female. And notice it adds up to 100%, 1,000 hours, 100%. And looking at these percentages, you, you can actually determine whether there's a relationship between gender and whether they vote Republican or Democrat. What do we do with two quantitative variables? Remember, these variables come to us in pairs. We graph them. And we look at what at the graph and see if we come up, can come up with any pattern. Um, here we have 10 students, and I asked them, I gave them a test, so I have their exam scores. And I asked them to write down what their height in inches is. So for every one of my 10 students, I have an exam score and I have a height. And you know why? Because I have a theory. And I'm testing my theory here. My theory is that the shorter you are, the better you will do on a test. And anyone who knows me knows I might be a little bit uh, self-interested here, but we won't go into that. Um, and I have something to base it on, right? Because if you're tall, and I feel bad for all those tall people, the oxygen has to get all the way up to your brain. This, this can't be helpful. So I have my theory. And I decide to test the theory by collecting data. And I plot the data. And I get the, the uh, plot that you see. The scat, it's called a scatter plot. I did it with Excel. And um, it's kind of hard to come up with any relationship here, isn't it? What I would like to see is maybe uh, that for the taller people, they should be associated with a lower exam score. No, it's not. Basically, it's not working out. So I'm going to have to do something else. Um, we can also get metrics here, but we're not really going to study these until we do the lectures on correlation and regression. Uh, however, it doesn't hurt for you to see it. And uh, there's a correlation coefficient listed of 0.12, the square of that, which is also meaningful is 0.01 and basically what those numbers those metrics say to us unfortunately for my theory is it they say no relationship this is example two we're looking we're going to look at the scatter plot and notice what x is hours studied weekly somebody actually studied studies 15 hours a week and we have somebody who only spends an hour and a half studying and we're also looking at the high school averages which seem to be going from around a 53 all the way up to a 99. Okay, so we plot this. So we have basically two measurements for each subject. We know how much they study per week, it's an average, and we know what their high school average was. 
look at the scatter plot, and it kind of seems linear. Obviously, it's not the points are not all on a line, but one look at this, and I'd say, wow, this is a linear with a positive slope, which basically indicates the more you study, the higher your high school average. Okay, and you can see that. Look at the last point, all the way to the right. That represents the point. You can see it's between 14 and 16. That's the 15. That's the person who spent 15 hours studying, and they're almost, but not quite touching the 100 mark because they had a 99 average. So these points are, each point represents an XY combination. And if you, when we learn correlation, the correlation actually is going to be significant and it's a positive 0.7843. We didn't learn how to test this yet for significance. It will be significant, showing there's a positive relationship between hours studied and high school average, which means you can tell people that generally, the more you study, the better you'll do in high school. And I think the same would be true of college. Example three of a scatter plot. We're looking at a high school average, same as before. But now we're looking at hours sleep, how much you sleep per day. Uh, we notice we have somebody there sleeping. We're looking at 17 students, and somebody sleeps seven, uh, 14 hours a day. But of course, he's including sleeping during class. Okay, so uh, there's somebody who's only sleeping six hours. We want to know is there a relationship between how much time you spend sleeping and your high school average? Again, we have 17 people, so we have 17 points on the graph. We draw the line through it using Excel. You'll learn how to do that. There's instructions on how to use uh, Excel to get a scatter plot. And it looks very linear, but it looks like it has a negative slope, right? Look at it carefully. You can see the last point. You can see the point where it's 14. That's all the way to the right. That 14 is the person who had a 50 average. You can see that point. So you see each point represents a pair of observations. And clearly, it looks like a negative relationship. That's a negative slope we're looking at. And again, as you see, some points fell on the line. Most are not on the line, but the line does the best job. It's a regression line. It's uh, the best, no line does a better job uh, going through these points. And we'll learn how uh, we get this line. And notice the correlation coefficient. It's negative, to show a negative slope, negative 0.916. That's going to turn out to be significant when you learn about significance tests. And basically, we can conclude people who sleep a lot are not going to do so well in high school. You've got to cut down a little bit on your sleep. By now, you know you've got to just do a lot of problems, practice, practice, practice. And uh, you'll find a lot of problems in the notes and homework assignments. The more you do, the better you'll get at this. And as we keep telling you, this is an important course. We're not indoctrinating you. We're teaching you how to use data. You can come to the right conclusions. I don't care if you're left-leaning, right-leaning, center-leaning. Use data properly, and you're going to become a smarter person.